Welcome back everyone. So this is the fifth instalment of the History of the Seattle Mariners, a fantastic series that has been put together by uh, John Boyce and Alex Rubenstein. And this is The Age of Ichiro, which a couple of people said is their favourite episode. Yeah. Well, I say a couple, I mean, it makes sense. Like a, <laughs> Two people. A very <laughs> insignificant pull. There will definitely be more, but they actually specifically yeah. grabbed out this particular episode and said this is the one. I can see so, why, because he's pretty beloved and nearby most... We, um, well, every Mariner fan we've spoken to, yeah, to be fair. yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And we, we have seen a video in the past by I can't remember the name of the channel, it's eluding me, but it went through a lot of um Ichiro's career in like yeah. a 10 minute span. So, this is nearly an hour long, so it's going to be a real interesting insight to kind of get just how much he meant to yeah. the Mariner organization because I don't really feel like we got that before so that's no, going to be really interesting it, it was a nice introduction um, just like the Ken Griffey Jr. one we watched but then when we saw him on this it went into way more detail of what he was about where he came from what impact he had and this is going to do exactly the same for Ichiro definitely uh, please give the video a like and let's jump into this one we hope that you enjoy A-Rod's team now, and in 2000, he made sure everyone knew it. It can be safely argued that despite missing two weeks due to a concussion, he pieced together the greatest individual season in Seattle Mariners history, even to this day. He finished with wow. an incredible wins above replacement figure of 10.4. If you choose to take that literally, you could say the Mariners, who Ooh. barely snuck into the playoffs after narrowly holding off Cleveland in the wildcard race, had Rodriguez to thank. There should have been hope in Seattle. After all, their 91 wins were a new franchise record. But the city had lost Randy Johnson one year, and Junior the next, yep. only to spend another year wondering how in the world they were going to keep A-Rod in town. He was set to become a free agent at season's end, and nearly a dozen teams were ready to drive truckloads wow. of money to his door. This <laughs> might happen again. <laughs> Imagine that. It couldn't <laughs> happen again. After making short work of the White Sox in the first round of the playoffs, they advanced to the ALCS to meet the Yankees. The ancient Again. beast they seemed to have yeah. awakened when they beat him back in 95. While the Mariners had spent the rest of the decade watching their massive potential go to waste, Griffey's old arch rival promptly turned around and won the World Series in 96, 98, and 99. A-Rod beat the hell out of him in that series, hitting 409 and leading so they ran into the Red Sox not long after that, and the Red Sox finally got their revenge. Yes, I did. believe they've gone on a bit of a dry run. I think so. Yeah. Since then, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's been a bit of a bit of a bleak period. Although I just did want to call this out really randomly. I would do this now in episode five of this series. <laughs> okay. But when we did our predictions video at the very beginning of the season, I said I thought that the Yankees were going to win the pennant. They yeah. may not, but. They are actually first at the time yeah. of recording this, they and I good. got I got slated for saying that in the comments. That's because people don't like the Yankees. A lot. Of I think it's like probably more people don't like me. And that, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Leading both teams in total bases, but he confronted the same immutable truth, Junior, had year front. after year, that no player, no matter how great, can do it himself. The Yankees sent the Mariners home in six games, on route to yet another World Series title. Their fourth in five years. Crazy. The loss tore A-Rod's heart out. He had a decision to make now. He could take Junior's road and stick it out, which ultimately ended with him getting homesick and heading back to Ohio without ever having caught his whale. Understandably, A-Rod took the money instead, signing a 10-year deal with the Rangers to complete what was then the I largest would. contract <laughs> in the history of sports. <laughs> and being paid what he was worth, he became the villain everywhere he went. Incredibly, both Rodriguez and the Rangers would later say they regretted the deal. A few years later, Rodriguez himself ended up on the Yankees. In a level of vengeance that reads like the Old Testament at this point, the former Seattle fan favorite was bashed relentlessly by New York media and resented by Yankees fans despite putting up incredible numbers. He was just eaten alive out here. It's tempting to wonder how it might have been different. In 1995, no. when Edgar Martinez hit the double that saved Seattle baseball, the batter on deck was a 20-year-old Alex Rodriguez, who hadn't yet done much of anything in the major leagues. You may have noticed him off in the margins of that unforgettable shot of Junior. What if Edgar hadn't hit that double? 
and A-Rod had a chance to step in and take one of the most consequential at-bats in the history of baseball. Would he have remained a Mariner for life after that? Would his legacy have been different somehow? It's impossible to say. But he was on his own road now. As for the Mariners, their 1990s fever dream had passed. They lost Junior one year, Randy the next, A-Rod the year after that. Edgar was still around and hitting well. I feel like we're going to need a little bit more on that. Like When he left to go to the Rangers, did he just go where the highest offer was? Because Rangers, when they won the World Series last year, that was their first, right? I mean, yeah, it was, yeah. So yeah. they hadn't. Yeah. They weren't exactly a winning organisation. So no, but I'm just wondering if he did. Maybe that was where the A-Wad came from. He went yeah. to the highest bidder. A quarter of a billion dollars will do that to you. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'd like to think I would stick to my morals. Yeah, no, of course you would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you have to let me know because obviously we've got no context around that. So, yeah, help us out in the comments. Oh, but he was 38 years old all of a sudden, and he had been battling issues with his eyesight. He'd had trouble tracking the ball, a terrifying problem for a hitter, and required daily vision exercises just to stay in baseball at all. Wow. The aging Jay Buhner was still on the roster, but his career was all but finished. Fuck his hair. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm great, but I'm During that Mariners so game season in 2000, Seattle fans had camped out in line outside Safeco Field for World Series tickets. They'd sat out there in the rain for days on end. Among them was a woman there to buy tickets as a gift for her mother, accompanied by her little pet ferret, dressed up in a matching Mariners jersey and ball cap. After days of being rained on and made fun of by passersby, they packed up and went home with nothing. Oh, poor ferret. The party was over. There's a lot of ferrets in American culture, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> it keeps cropping up in various programs we're watching at the moment. Hard Knocks, Friday Night Lights, Seattle Mariners series. Oh wow, this is this is a long way up. It is. This is like the this is the stairway to heaven. They're about plus nine hundred games at this point. <laughs> I think it just glitched. That's yeah. why the video's 50 odd minutes. It's just it's, this going round and round. Yeah, video's skipping. This is going to be quite soothing, to be fair. Man, this is wild. What? That's what? Crazy. What? <laughs> Alex? That's crazy. What the fuck was that? <laughs> 116 wins. Tied with the Cubbies. Nearly Coming a century off that earlier. Franchise record 91 win season, the Mariners exploded for an MLB record tying 116 wow. wins. Wow. Matching the 1906 Cubs. What's that, 46 losses? They were losses? among the best in MLB at everything, scoring more That's runs nuts. than everyone and allowing fewer runs than everyone. Just a get rid of your star players. Reason. 300 plus run differential That's between crazy. the two. Well, they won the World Series in 20, 2001. Yeah. It's just everyone forgot it, and that's why they haven't been to the World Series. <laughs> For this domination of the entire MLB landscape oh my stemmed life. from internal improvement of guys already on the team. Starting wow. pitchers Freddie Garcia and Aaron Seeley each had what was ultimately the best year of their lengthy careers. The ageless Jamie Moyer continued his agelessness as he approached his fifth decade of life, painting corners with his 85 mile an hour fastball and off-speed craftsmanship and joining Garcia in the top four of AL Cy Young voting. Arthur Rhodes, Crazy. Jeff Nelson, and closer Kazuhiro Sasaki spearheaded MLB's best bullpen with an unheard of for that era ERA of 3.04. Their offense still had Edgar at the tail end of his peak, and they got the best season from the career of Griffey's center field heir apparent, Mike Cameron, in year two in the Emerald City. But two new bats in particular were what really catapulted a very good team into an absolute juggernaut. Brett Second Boone. baseman Brett Boone signed a free agent deal with George the Mariners right, prior to that 01 season. Yeah. The 10 year we'll vet say, came we'll into the is. year a career 255 batter who'd never had a 100 RBI season while homering on about 3.2% of his at bats. From out of nowhere, a suddenly jacked Boone good, batted 331, six, drove in his 100th run on August 1st, and had a home run rate that spiked to just a shade under 6% in 2000. Quite serendipitous. And while Buner oh, missed word. most of the season with a foot <laughs> injury, the sun had set on his time in right field regardless. 
ceded to a new Mariner who was ready to take everything we thought we knew about baseball and flip it completely upside down. To take every limit, ceiling, or boundary we might naturally expect from a ball player and blow it to smithereens. The 2001 American League Most uh, Valuable This was player, his rookie Ichiro season. Then. Suzuki. Yeah. I wondered if he was going to come in at the end and then he was just going to keep on going. So this was the season. Well, that's mad, isn't it? Yeah. 116 46 record. Where to start? Okay. We think of the balance between science and sentimentalism as a sliding scale, right? If you're more of one, you're less of the other. Well, Ichiro is both. I'm just thinking as well, even with that, I'm assuming that it was a 162 game season in 2001 I don't actually know because yeah. obviously as we know franchises come and go yeah I mean if it's less than it's even more, impressive. more incredible yeah, yeah definitely in extreme measure take his bats for example the scientists in him would travel with a custom built dehumidifier to regulate their moisture content and adjust it according to the climate of the city he was in the sentimentalist in him once felt so guilty about throwing his bat in frustration that he took it back to his hotel room and tucked it into bed that night and later wrote a letter of apology to his manufacturer. <laughs> wow. It is incredibly difficult and almost impossible to innovate as an offensive baseball player. While sports like football and basketball have evolved dramatically over the years in base. Oh, sorry, that's crazy. Like, that imagine, nuts. imagine actually taking an inanimate object. Imagine saying the word inanimate. <laughs> yeah. like, like you haven't had three beers before recording. Um, I told you uh, to keep it to one beer. I, I used <laughs> imagine taking a baseball bat to bed with you. I know, like it's wild, tucking it in, like feeling just, guilty about throwing it. I'm so sorry about what happened earlier. <laughs> I didn't mean it. I mean, there's conditions for that, right? I mean, yeah. that doesn't sound too healthy. Baseball, the cake is pretty much baked. To me, only four offensive players have really stood out as iconoclasts whose statistical footprint made clear that they were playing a different variant of the sport, that they found greatness by doing what no one around them was doing. First, Babe Ruth. For the first 50 years or so of baseball, virtually nobody hit more than 20 home runs in a season. Ted then Ruth yeah. set the all-time record with 29, a, then nearly geez. doubled his own record the next year with 54, and the dam broke after that. Then there was Ricky Henderson, who set the modern single-season stolen base record with 130. No one's come within okay, miles of it good in decades, just bases. like no one else has <laughs> ever stolen anywhere near 1,400 bases. But it was more Bombs than just that. Right. He was also a yeah. great hitter who was masterful at drawing walks, and was far better than most base dealers at getting on base in the first place. There's only ever been one Ricky Henderson. Of course, we have to acknowledge Barry Bonds, although not for his home run hitting. An on-base percentage of at least 500 is almost unheard of. Only 10 guys have ever done it. Bonds did it four times in four consecutive That's years. Still the fourth and final member of this club yeah. is Ichiro, the first ever Japanese position player Ichiro. to break into Major Ichiro. League Baseball, I might and one of only 32 before. players ever to retire with 3,000 hits. This shouldn't have been possible. Unlike the other 31 who typically began their Major League careers around age 20, an agreement between Japanese and American baseball prevented Ichiro from entering the majors until his age 27 season. It was a shame since Ichiro had wanted to play alongside Junior and A-Rod for years, only to finally end up in Seattle right after they both left town. He oh. really had to bust his hump to get into this 3,000 hit club. Junior didn't make it here. Neither did Babe Ruth, Barry Bonds, or Ted Williams. Against all logic, despite showing up nearly a decade late, That's crazy. Ichiro did. Yeah, that is. In the wake of having spent the first nine professional seasons crazy. of his career in Japan, when he finally arrived in Seattle, his effort to make up for lost time Seven, eight years far exceeded else. Yeah. anything we'd ever seen in MLB history. From day one, and like for a decade moving forward, nah. Ichiro piled up over 2,200 hits. Not only is that by far the most that any players ever had in any 10-year stretch, but for the most part, Ichiro didn't even need 10 years. He surpassed 2,000 hits during his ninth season. After 2009, he could have actually just been like, nah, I'm good, taking the <laughs> ensuing season off and still have been the first player since Pete Rose to have cleared 2K in any 10-year run. There's no one else you can even mention in the same breath. Ichiro simply existed in his own universe of batting wizardry. Three main factors brought him here. The yeah, first was crazy. his incredible ability to stay healthy and in shape. In 2017, keep in mind, Ishiro had been in the States for more than 15 years by this time, Tom Brady reached out to him to ask about his workout regimen. 
Ichiro had no idea who he was. Second, his masterful ability to hit anything and place the ball anywhere. We have hit location data dating back to the 1988 season. From then until now, Ichiro has more singles up the middle than anybody and has more singles to the opposite field than anybody. Within this same window, we can look at every player who managed at least 2,500 hits. In general, their hits landed to a preferred side of the field or in the middle. They only hit the ball to the opposite side of the field about half as often. Ichiro, meanwhile, was less predictable than anybody, hitting toward left field and right field almost equally as often. Now, a lot wow. of these were infield hits, which... Oh, I see what he means. So, it's equally spread. I was looking at this graph completely differently to begin with. So, yeah, he's right. So, typically speaking... Yeah, so over 50% went down the middle. Yeah, if you watch these lines... Yeah. I was trying to look at even where the one that's close to it goes. Don't know. No, it's not clear enough. A lot of, I'm guessing... A, well, a lot of these are right-handed, so they're put it there pulling to the left because a lot a lot of these are yeah a lot more are going to the left fielder than the right fielder but it's crazy that his is like almost symmetrical and like over 50 percent straight down the middle you wouldn't see this on a kid's crown mat at a restaurant would you no. try and follow that you get lost <laughs> <laughs> but no that's that is pretty it brings um, us to his third superpower yeah. his speed again within this same window each row legged out more infield hits than anybody Statheads will rightly point out here that he only has that many in the first place because his batted ball stayed in the infield so often, which isn't optimal. Who cares? Oh, okay. Just watch him in the 2001 All-Star game, which naturally so is in some. Seattle. Facing off against our old friend Randy Johnson, he dinks one over to first. This should be a guaranteed out, but this is what made yeah. Ichiro so exciting. Virtually picture, any ground right? ball was a three-second thriller. They must Remember be this, it's 90 feet from home to first, but just 60 from the pitcher's mound to first. Yeah. Ichiro has 50% more ground to cover than Randy does. Now, let's play it again from the oh, top. Oh, okay, he's Randy. Right. 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 If I was 800 foot, so we're Ichiro probably just made up a 30-foot disadvantage in three and a half seconds. Still crazy. He ran like yeah. this on every batted ball, in every game he played, for years and years. Even if they did throw him out, every ground ball he hit produced a fire drill. I'm not sure there's ever been a more exciting baseball player. Just as compelling as his statistical footprint, which seems to belong to a player from a different age, is the man himself. Ichiro, you bat left-handed despite being a natural righty. Why is that? I don't know. Ichiro, <laughs> haven't you been intimidated by all- Wait, what did he actually say? Righty. Why is that? I just always hit that way, and I have no memory why. <laughs> That's random. He's so right-handed, but he batted left-handed. Yeah, and he just always hit. To be fair, I'm right-handed, but I, I play a guitar left-handed. So when I hold a guitar and play, it'll be backwards for you. So this is going to be even more confusing. But yeah, I yeah, would. No, I'd, I'd have to strum with my right hand. That's yeah, that's strange. Yeah, fair enough. Despite the fact I'm right-handed, yeah. so it could just be something like that, maybe. Just, yeah. I don't know. Each well, other feels haven't you been intimidated by all these big, strong American pitchers? No. Ichiro, <laughs> who do you ask for advice when you're in a slump? Nobody. Me. Ichiro, <laughs> in just your eighth Major League Baseball game, you made one of the throws of the decade to nail Terrence Long from right field. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I remember that. How did you do it? Watching the game, where? Why did you run when I was going to throw him out? <laughs> Ichiro, what's your dog's name? I don't have my dog's permission to tell you that. Each of you, what would you retire? I don't know, I guess I'll die. There's something I find wow. really inspiring about Ichiro's friendly, matter-of-fact stubbornness. You can see it in his words and in his play. None of this was supposed to work. None of it was supposed to carry over from Japan. I'll probably just but Ichiro die. knew it would. And he wasn't going to change a damn thing about the way he played baseball. Analyst and former player Rob Dibble declared at the start of the season that if Ichiro won the batting title, He'd get an Ichiro tattoo on his butt and run around Times Square in a G-string. That season, Ichiro hit 350 and won the batting title, the Rookie of the Year award, oh, wow. the MVP award, a Silver Slugger, and a Gold Glove. Thanks for playing, Rob. He yeah, did it. Got his name yeah. tattooed on his like butt. Junior, in Japanese. Ichiro is one of the most thrilling and unique baseball players the sport has ever seen. And just like the Mariners in the 90s belonged to Junior. The Mariners of the Yachts belonged to Ichiro. It's mad that he's virtually hitting every game. Yeah. But yeah, you need you need players like that. You need hitters. 
Ichiro was a player unlike any other when it came to game to game reliability. He was a metronome who had five different seasons in which he got a hit in at least 130 games. Not only has no one else ever had more than two such seasons, but Ichiro alone counts for nearly a third of all the times that's been done in the integration era. That's just for games with at least one hit. How about games with multiple hits? Well, he also had five seasons in which he did that in at least Tony 70 Quinn. games, That's the name I was looking when, for. again, no one else has more than twice White in this box. time. That's Kirby five Puckett. seasons where he could have been reasonably considered to have a near coin flip chance of multiple hits well. each and every time out, which, again, Hank accounts Aaron. for quite a oh, significant yeah. chunk of all such seasons. If we did miss any like really huge names there, it's not because <laughs> we didn't know who they were. I was just struggling to actually read them. <laughs> yeah, same. Same. So, well, yeah, especially your age. You should have oh, asked. Man. I could have told you. I need some new glasses. But one of my favorite Ichiro things I've discovered is that in 2004, throughout the 60 Ooh, games glasses. the Mariners played between June 30th and September 4th, he accumulated 120 hits. Put down your calculators. I gotcha. That <laughs> <you>. isn't even <laughs> two hits per Mariners game for a period stretching more than two months. I was that's curious a, if job. anyone else has ever sniffed a similar cluster of hits across such a lengthy amount of time. No. Turns out, not really. Here is every instance going back over 70 years of an MLB player reaching even 100 hits across any 60 game stretch of his team season. It's extremely rare. Just not for Ichiro. Propelled by those couple scintillating months, Four Ichiro times. put himself in position to wage an assault on George Sisler's 84-year-old record of 257 hits in a single season. A five-hit outburst on September 21st in Anaheim meant 2004 Ichiro became just the second player to surpass 240 hits since the Hoover administration, joining 2001 Ichiro. That's crazy. They then where did he where did he sit in the batting order? Was he was he a lead off or I'm just thinking typically yes where you'd want your hit I, I don't know cuz I'm I'm thinking of a rise so I in my head I'm thinking you'd have him lead off um, yeah. to get him on base and then you have someone that can just hit bombs coming up next. This might be laugh when you say stuff like that. Just hitting bombs into the crowd. <laughs> I get it off. I'm, I'm Americanizing myself with the terms that are used How in the video. How can make baseball more fun? <laughs> I mean, that's going to freak people out. Yeah, so I'm wondering if he'll be a lead off batter. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Then wrapped up a lengthy road trip with Ichiro standing at 256 hits, just one shy of Sisler's mark with a three game homestand against the Rangers on deck to oh, wrap up the it. season. In what was supposed to be a weekend honoring the retiring Edgar Martinez in the final few games of his career, Ichiro wasted zero time in <laughs> providing plenty of more festivities Stole to thunder. celebrate. To lead off the series, he hit this chopper that found its way to left field. Strikes on him. And a ground ball will not there it is! There's the tie! There's number 257! Record tied. But things could have soon gone very awry when Ichiro lost his footing while attempting to make a play on this oh, third wow. inning foul ball. It's cool though. Since he's a cyborg, Ichiro was totally fine to lead off the next frame for his second at bat of the game. He came down he just at the end. relegated then. Sisler to a silver well, medal. Crown jewels are going to be in all kinds of middle. trouble. <laughs> and a crown ball back at the middle. Straight up, yeah. yeah. Seattle was overflowing with pride. Hitting out of his little room. Japan was overflowing with pride. Ichiro had reached immortality. He tacked on That's another crazy. four hits across his final 12 at bats for good measure to finish yeah, up at impressive. 262. Records are meant to be broken, but it would be stunning if this one doesn't last until the sun burns out. On a more <laughs> macro level, that was the second of That's five career years, seasons in which he taught 220 oh, hits. Oh, wow. No one else has ever done that five times, and in the integration era, no one's even close, with Ichiro once again single-handedly accounting for an outsized portion of all such seasons. He's the best at what he does, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. I still can't get over this season. 
That is yeah. insane. In the it, 2001 postseason, despite being on the wrong end of the second most lopsided playoff contest ever in Game 3 of the ALDS in Cleveland that had him on the brink oh. of elimination, they did rally to reach the ALCS and a date with those Yankees. Oh, same again. <laughs> it's it's always the Yankees. Went to a game seven. Oh, I'm not sure yet if went to a game seven. Uh, oh, why do I feel like... I, I feel, well, you know, it's bad news. Of course it is. They've never been to the World Series, have they? Let alone win. Again, they dug themselves into a mess of a hole, dropping each of the first two games at home. <sighs> Again, they tried to rally with a blowout Game Ooh. 3 win in the Bronx, followed by this Brett Boone homer that broke a scoreless tie and gave him an eighth inning lead in Game 4. Oh, no. Oh, to come back and win. They were on the verge of tying up the series if their bullpen, unflappable all season, could cleanly record just six more outs. This is the Mariners we're talking about, so Arthur Rhodes well, yeah, awesome, the e all year, record, didn't they? gave that oh, run yeah. back to Bernie Williams in the bottom half of the eighth. It'll be a 3-2. Swung on and hit high in the air to deep right. That ball is high. It is far. It is good. Not good enough for me. Before Kaz Sasaki, <laughs> Should have called awesome, that. all year, allowed Alfonso Soriano to walk the thing off in the ninth in what proved oh. to be the dagger to Seattle's heart. Deal. Swung on, hit high in the air to deep right center field. That goes Ichiro on the track at the wall. She's gone. Oh dear. Oh, oh wow. Seattle had this inconceivable baseball force fall right into their lap and after falling short that first year together in 01 not even Ichiro could drag the M's back. <laughs> He's so criminal isn't it because yeah. how can you have a season like that and you're not going to the World Series? So bad. I do there's something about especially the wild card round now there's something about going through the agony of 162 games to know that in two games because it, it's just the best of three isn't it yeah. it could just be over, All over. Like, bang done and that's why it's like when people say about the West and I'm going to probably just jinx everything <laughs> I hope I'm not but the people that say like about the Dodgers like being a terrible or a pretty poor postseason team mm. whereas like you've got the D-backs that are seeing that if they do get in they're going to be so dangerous because they're such a great playoff team yeah. it's crazy how you get it's, those teams and that's what the Yankees can, were so good at yeah it's just strange if you can dominate the whole regular season and then it goes to pot in the like, it's just the same game you're playing so the same game of baseball it's like know? the Chiefs last season when it came to the postseason it's like a different team yeah it's, it's strange it's, it's weird really isn't it strange. it's crazy yeah back to October baseball. Not, you mean, Not in 2002, out. when an impressive 93 wins were only good enough for third place in the suddenly hyper-competitive AL West. Wow. Huh. Not Oakland. in 2003, yeah, that'll be when the... they seemed destined for the playoffs, only to the suffer a four-game sweep it? in late August. What was it? Oh my god, his name's Bean, not Boone. I did think, I did wonder if you met Billy Bean earlier, and I was like, no, I'm not going to say it, just because I'll believe you won. But yeah, you, I thought you meant Billy Bean, when you said he's related to Billy. <laughs> Billy Boone. You know what I'm thinking of, isn't, isn't there one of the managers, isn't the manager of the uh, Yankees? Was it, yeah, yeah, Yankees is Boone, isn't it? Yeah. 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 That's what I meant. Is that him? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not committed to anything. Try, I'm just trying to save myself, <laughs> dig myself out of this hole. August in Boston. The Red Sox, led by Seattle's old friend David Ortiz, used the series to pull even in the wildcard standings and launch into the postseason over the 93-win Mariners. Since the 1995 advent of the LDS, no other team has ever won 90-plus games in back-to-back -back seasons while seeing their invitation to the postseason dance get lost in the mail both years, oh. let alone to have won 93 in each year while residing in a tiny division. So the post-01 drop-off was shocking. In fact, following that season of pure magic, 
the Mariners' playoff drought that immediately commenced extended far past just those oh, next couple seasons. My. How does that it happen? It spanned the final eight years of the aughts. <sighs> then the entirety of the 2010s oh, wow. and indefinitely into the great beyond. We're going to be going into the future if this carries on. That is crazy. We're going to see what's coming up. <laughs> Look away. Oh, when this the is NFL's terrible. Buffalo Bills snagged a wild card spot in the last week of the 2017 season, it bequeathed to the Mariners the longest active playoff drought in the Big Four North American sports leagues. They're the only team that could possibly go from teasing a fan base with a season of record breaking success directly into a historically long run of ineptitude. Oh. Nuts. So I do see, I do take your point between 2003 and 2004, like how does that happen? Because we're kind of seeing something similar this season with, for such a heavy turnaround with the Marlins. Yeah. They got into the wild card round. They got there at courtesy of the Cubs. Sorry yeah. for bringing it up. That's fine. Um, That's fine. We weren't there at all, so it's not like I'm digging. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, this season... I don't know. I don't actually know what happened to put the Marlins in the spot they're now in. I think, did, did they lose important players at the end of 2003? Because yeah. like, I get one bad season, but that is season after season after season of being Well, it's how bad, bad the season was as well. It's this huge turn, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. Uh, I suppose maybe this is just something that everyone's like... <laughs> Lads, this is just this is baseball. This is just and we just marriage. haven't we haven't got used to it yet. And this no, is going to be the sort of thing that can, can happen. Be, they can be plus ninety three. I think they said, didn't they? Ninety three wins, and then the very next season, yep. what's that minus? I don't do you reckon? know. That's got minus to be a, twenty games. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Twenty games off five hundred. It doesn't look great. But yeah, this is why I think in baseball, especially, you've just got to enjoy the moment. Yeah, yeah, crazy. turned up in 2018 if you're only interested in winning and losing be this is the end of the <laughs> no. story 43 seasons the vast majority of them losing seasons 3219 wins 3622 losses zero championships zero world series appearances at least some of you will stop watching and at this point we don't mind i mean I'm, i mean it it's really okay but <laughs> as far as alex and i are concerned it's only now that we've gotten to the entire point of all this. The Seattle Mariners challenge us like no other team. By this, I don't mean that they test our patience, although that's certainly true. I, where he's gonna go with I mean that they mm. offer us an opportunity to appreciate sports as something more than endless conquests. They've never won a World Series, but ask yourself honestly, does this look incomplete to you? Far be it from me to tell any lifelong Mariners fan how to feel about any of this, but for the rest of us, what is it truly missing? Is it this? Is this what you want? Is it really? Okay, here, take it all in. There's Randy Johnson, shut out against the Marlins in Game 1 of the World Series. There's Edgar, whose 11th inning single drove in the winning run of Game 4. Yeah. And A-Rod, who dove around the tag to take a 3-1 series lead. There's Buner, who came off the bench in Game 5 to crush a pivotal pinch hit double. And there's Junior, who stepped into the box in the bottom of the ninth and delivered a three-run, championship-clinching walk-off. The kingdom went crazy. What a moment that was. If that's what you wanted, you got what you wanted. Now, of all these stories, what's your favorite? What's the story you're telling first? If that was the one, you aren't ready for this team yet. The Mariners aren't special on account of their lack of success. I can't, I can't get what you're saying there, because that is the goal, isn't it? To win to win it but they've had so many the Mariners have given their fans way more significant moments than that with the the um, the Griffey Jr Ichiro and then even on their losing seasons they've given them great memories uh, I'm guessing that's what he's alluding to um, but they've had to fight for their existence for so long yeah. um, I don't think there's probably many other franchises that have gone through half of what they've gone through yeah and I'm guessing if you, if you told a Mariner to name their top five Moments or or things they remember when they talk about the Mariners, then yeah. winning it won't be the first one. No, it'd be Dean um, reacts watching this exactly, series. Yeah. Um, the important <laughs> things, <laughs> us giving our nonsense like opinion on on the franchise. But yeah, I think that's what he's alluding to. This, although they have never won it, overall they they've given their fans. I would just watch a lot. I'll be honest. He's asking where where you would go. I would just watch two thousand and one on repeat. 
just a regular season. Yeah. And then I would just, I would like get this fantasy where I just play out the postseason to that season and all the yeah. other records go and the, it's just a complete annihilation. The era of Ken Griffey Jr., um, Randy Johnson and A-Rod is a pretty special time as well. It was, that all still happened. Yeah. <laughs> just that success is entirely irrelevant. We've entered another realm here, one that's yeah. far larger and doesn't operate on the dead currency of winning and losing. Unless you let those limits go, you're an astronaut who brought your wallet. The Seattle Mariners are not competitors. They're protagonists. Go on, teach me. Still, there's no denying the heartache. They had already seen the moment pass once. When a second four-year window opened out of nowhere, they won 393 games, more than any other team in Major League Baseball. They didn't win a World Series or even get to one. That was their shot, and they missed it. If you're having a hard time with this, that's okay. So were the Mariners, starting with manager Lou Pinella. A very real consequence of putting a baseball team in Seattle is that it's just so far away from everything. It's baseball's moon colony, far flung oh, yeah. from even its closest left. neighbors. It's what Junior found so difficult as a rookie all those years ago. It's one of the reasons he left for Cincinnati in 2000. It's part of being a Mariner. Pinella was from Florida, which, as the crow oh, yeah. flies, is closer to Brazil exist. than it is to Seattle. The After the 2002 spot, season, like, yeah, the man who took the Mariners parts. to the playoffs four times, and the only manager ever to do it at all, left town to manage the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. For a manager of a perennially winning team to up and leave for any other team is virtually unheard of, especially if he's on good terms with the front office, which it seems that Pinella was. But this is the team he left for. The Devil Rays lost 106 games in 02. Oof. They were a horrifyingly bad baseball team. Lou Pinella had traded this for this. But that didn't matter to him. It's testament to just how badly mm. he needed to go home. In fairness, one thing I will say is I, I would actually rather take on, if, especially with a sporting team, this could be across any sport, I would actually rather go into a team that's in a pretty bad position because if it's completely screwed, you ain't going to make it any worse. No. Um, you're going to come out looking good if you And if you do, around. you've done exceptional to manage that. Yeah. You know, you're going to be remembered for all different kind of reasons. So yeah, sometimes you go in and teams are like, this is what people are now waiting, this is really to go a bit left field here, but for what people are waiting to see with Liverpool's new manager, because it seemed that Liverpool were quite on top when their manager Klopp left after nine years, mm. and you guys come in, relatively unknown, and it's about how's he going to deal with that. Yeah, It's much easier sometimes to come in and pick up something that's in complete disarray, because yeah, you'd like to think that you can make all these changes and improve it. And maybe that's what he was going to do at Tampa. Yeah, maybe, maybe. We already know all about the Mariners' Randy Johnson trade and how he reached supernova levels immediately upon leaving town. Well, Randy. eventually, mm. history would repeat itself oh. with another Randy. <laughs> Every guy that Randy. <laughs> Randy uh. Wynn originally broke into the majors in Tampa during the late 90s, <laughs> blossoming into an all-star outfielder there by 2002. Upon the conclusion of that season over in Seattle was when Pinella wanted out of his contract so he could manage a club closer to his Tampa home. A club like, say, Tampa. The Mariners obliged, but only if they got significant compensation in return. The Devil Rays thus dangled Wynn, and a deal was consummated. Wynn provided a couple years of above Randy average Wynn. play for the M's, all the way up through July 29th, 2005, when he went 4 for 5 with a homer. Then immediately following that game, GM Bill Bavese flipped him to San Francisco ahead of the trade deadline for a box of Cracker Jacks and a half-eaten ham sandwich. <laughs> all Wynn did down the stretch as That's a giant trade. was hit better than just about anyone wow. else in the league, outside perhaps Todd Helton of Mile High, Colorado. In yeah. fact, in September of that 05 season, he became just the, the eighth player in the integration era to amass 100 total bases within a single calendar month. It's an accomplishment that, as of 2020, 
no one had done in the generation since Wynn did. So if you're a baseball team in need of a historically strong half-season jolt, just call the Mariners and see if you can pry a Randy loose. <laughs> oh, and you want to guess where Randy Wynn was from? The Bay Area. He played college ball in Santa Clara. Clearly, he just needed to go home. Let's fast forward just a bit to 2007. I went to school in Seattle, go dogs. Yeah. so I've always sort of just kept a corner of my eye out on the M's since you never know what kind of weirdness they might be up to next. And one thing I noticed as the 2007 season moved along was that while maintaining a good overall record, they frequently came up on the short end of games that weren't particularly competitive. Here's the run differential of every team to win exactly 88 games within the modern 162 game schedule. Most have a very strong differential. All have a positive differential, except for the Mariners, the worst in this sample Ooh. by miles. They existed in isolation, quarantined Whoa. off from the rest of the pack who That's behaved like normal 88 win teams. Ichiro aside, the Mariners' best player in the back half of the decade was third baseman Adrian Beltre, who they landed in 2005. By the time he finally retired in Texas in 2018, he did so as a no-doubt future Hall of Famer. The season before he headed to Seattle, in fact, he enjoyed the best year of his career with the Dodgers, hitting 334 with 48 home runs and very nearly winning the MVP award over Barry Bonds. So what's this about? Well, you see that M shape right in the middle of this chart? It corresponds perfectly with the five years Beltre spent in Seattle. Oh. It's like the Mariners <laughs> dug up their old logo and used it as a pastry cutter ah. to squeeze down the prime <laughs> years of his career. As soon as he showed up in town, his wins above replacement fell from 9.6 to 3.2. He wasn't injured either, he was just not the same. After 2009, he left for Boston and his war immediately more than doubled, and remained pretty steady until he started to battle injuries nearing age 40. I have yeah. never seen a player turn his statistics into visual art like this. <laughs> fascinating, fascinating man. That actually is freaky. Yeah. Something's just After meant to be. After spending three years in the cellar, manager Mike Hargrove was finally turning the team around. He'd been hired after the 2004 train wreck and steadily improved the team from 63 wins to 69 to 78. And in 2007, his... So you asked this earlier, so 63 wins in a modern season, that would be 63.99 which means that they yeah. were negative 36. Wow. Can't okay. remember what I even said when you asked, but that Can't is your remember. definitive... These Mariners were 11 <laughs> games over 500 by the end of June. They'd won seven games in a row, something they hadn't done in four years, and were setting themselves up for a strong playoff run. And then the next morning, Hargrove quit. Wow. Okay. Problems with the... Uh, there were no health issues. Lack of passion. There was no disagreement with the front office. His heart just wasn't in it, he said. Maybe he was just tired of baseball. He was 57 years old. That happens. Except, only two months later, he accepted an offer to manage the BJs, a semi-pro team in Little huh. Kansas. And by this point, you can probably guess why. Hargrove grew up nearby and played for the oh. BJs in the early 70s. He it's gave a up a here, big salary, Nobody a wants shiny to live in Seattle. Stadium, and a winning major league team home. for this. He just you had to go BJ's. <laughs> Managers don't leave winning teams they're on good terms with just so they can manage somewhere else. This never happens. It happened to the Mariners twice in five years. Maybe he was just feeling the pressure. Maybe. Given it was a semi-pro team, potentially. But yeah, I mean, what's, what's wrong with living in Seattle? Yeah, from why what does, I see, it's a Why nice... is it making everybody want to go home? Have you ever been to Seattle? No, no. Do you but... get much sleep? Sleep, no, I was sleepless in Seattle, mate. Yeah, um, I've never been, but I've seen, I've done research on the place when looking where yeah. I'm going to go in America. And it looks like a very nice city. You got a big tower there. Um, they have. They've What's got it called? Big tower. Can't remember. Ah. But it's a big tower, yeah. Big tower. Yeah. Is it windy? No, that's Chicago. Windy city. What's Chicago. Seattle? What's the city? What's it called? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if the nickname for Seattle. Sorry, mate. Did the research. Power hitter Richie Sexton was home, more or less, having <laughs> grown up in Washington State. When the Mariners signed him to a long-term deal in 2005, it so should have been a great fit. At six foot yeah, eight, he satisfied the team's historic interest in tall guys, and his legendary pranks made him a natural fit in Seattle. 
It's reported that years prior, he would acquire alligators with their mouths duct taped shut and hide them in teammates' lockers. Okay, oh. let's hit pause on this. Do you have any idea how hard it is to tell a story about powerful rich men that last 32 years without an instance of someone doing something morally wrong? These guys Wait, never hurt anybody. They just had foibles and misadventures. Stick right. to taking cows don't they have on your like field trips. They don't snap. care. Oh, we they almost made it all the way to the end of this thing. You blew it, Richie. Anyway, the guy could mash, and we have the cherry picking to prove it. By his age 28 season, he had two 45 homer years under his belt, putting himself in the company of some of the all-time greatest power hitters. But injuries had thrown a wrench into his career. His home run ability was diminishing, and his batting average, which was never very high, was plummeting. 2008 would turn out to be his final season at age 33. By the 8th of May, the Mariners were already getting cooked, well on their way to one of their worst seasons in franchise history. 2007 was an aberration. This was the new normal. In the fourth inning of that night's game against the Rangers, Richie steps in and does something I have never seen before or since. He takes a pitch from Casey Gabbard that appears to be right over the plate, acts like he's been shot, charges the mound, and chucks his helmet at him. This has wow. to be the only instance in baseball history of a batter throwing at a pitcher without the pitcher throwing at the batter. Richie Sexton was, that was suspended cool. and later traded away midseason. The Mariners finished with 101 losses that year. They'd paid a lot of money for the Ooh. privilege, becoming the first team ever to lose at least 100 games with a payroll of at least $100 million. Ichiro Ouch. is now the only man left from that magical 2001 season. He'd seen it all fall apart. At the end of the season, a reporter asked him what the team needed to fix. He sat there fanning himself and said through his translator, We don't have time to explain. Days prior, an anonymous player went to the press claiming that Ichiro's teammates disliked him for his, quote, selfish style of play, whatever that meant, and that one player threatened to knock him out. Sounds like jealousy to me. Strange one. These largely yeah. disappointing years were overseen by general manager Bill Bavese, who took the job in 2004. Being a GM of a baseball team is an exasperating it. job. Players either get better or worse for no apparent reason, <laughs> he could. they suffer freak injuries, and you often have no control over whether or not they get along. Throw in the ridiculous and arbitrary nature of baseball itself, and it's enough to make you lose it. Apparently sensing his days in Seattle were numbered, he made a last-ditch effort to unify his team by attempting a mass citizen's arrest of some kind. Oh no, you can't do that, Bill. People have been thrown in jail for less, Bill. He was fired shortly thereafter. This team wasn't yeah. rebuilding, it wasn't sure a lovable loser, it was just busted. The Seattle Mariners were certainly no strangers to being bad, but after more than 30 years, it seemed like for the first time, they were truly unhappy. And I don't know about you, but at this point, I don't care much about winning. In a perfect world, happiness is all I would want for these people. I want Ichiro to have a good time. I want his old hero Jr. to come back so they can play together like Ichiro always dreamed about. I want him to, I don't know, run around the clubhouse and get in tickle fights. <laughs> I think we've wanted a lot of things. Thing is though, what do you do there? You've got a team that apparently hate each other and people are going to the press <clears> about <throat> it and starting to leak information outside. Yeah. You've got to do something. So yeah, you're never going to turn it around. Maybe you. lock himself in there with them. Um, or maybe, I don't know, I don't know what I would do. You've got to find out who's actually willing to fight and who's done. Yeah, and then exactly. if they're done, you just think, right, I mean, look, the season's like on its way out, so get... Get rid. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how early or late this happened throughout, to be sure, fair. Yeah, but, but yeah, you just kind of then, you just the work to just trade away the people that don't want to be there. It's always yeah. better to have people that want to be there. Exactly. Even if you're taking someone who is not, may not be aesthetically gifted, yes. if they really want to be there and they want to fight for the team, yep. that's more important than someone with the talent that doesn't want to be there and yep. doesn't really care. Um, because you can't, you can't rebuild a team with that many fractured relationships. Yes. Yeah, I don't know how much this like correlates into baseball, but I've always been of the opinion that even if you're giving up a bit of the technical ability, so someone with a little bit less technical ability in whatever yeah. sport, if they've got the absolute heart, passion and desire to play for that team, my team, I want them on that team. Exactly that, yeah. Two thousand and nine. Thank you, mate. It's all right. Mike Blowers was a local Given college baseball season. star and spent three different stints playing for the Mariners in the nineties before Probably landing a like broadcasting gig with the club following his playing days. And it's perhaps in that latter role where his true legacy lies. 
because that platform allowed the whole world to realize just who Mike Blowers really is, a spiritual medium. Don't believe me? Well, allow me to introduce you to their ball game in Toronto (laughs) on September 27th, 2009, and Blowers' pregame prediction for player of the game. Picks to click, final game of the series. Who's yours? Well, I think clearly it's going to be Tuiasa Sopo today. He swung the bat well the last few times that he's got an opportunity to play. I expect him to hit his first big league home run today. Second baseman like Tuiasa Sopo accounted for 189,487 of MLB's at bats in the nuts. 4,322 of which resulted in home runs. That's about 2.23% of them, meaning a roughly 1 in 45 shot of correctly pinpointing a particular at bat in which a second baseman will homer. Second at bat. As Blowers did in specifically identifying Tuiasa Sopo's second at bat of the game. He's going to get a fastball from Talent. Talent was a relief pitcher throughout I most of his tenure yeah, career, I think it is. but he was a starter in 09. It was by far long, his busiest yeah. season, notching over twice as many innings as any other and thus reaching a 3-1 count on 70 different occasions, of which he threw a fastball 80% of the time. And he's going to hit it out of left center field, probably, oh, maybe in the second deck. Of the 30,260 <laughs> homers hit by right-handed batters in the 2000s, 17,296 of them were pulled toward left, which amounts to about 57.2%. On a 3-1 count. On a 3-1 count. About 2.61% of the decade's 1.66 million at-bats ended right. on a 3 count. I don't think count, it was nearly everything. Or roughly like. 1 in 38. And that's inside ball three. <laughs> three balls, I've never been straight saddled on a 3-1 count in my life. That's the absolutely incredulous Dave Niehaus on the call. 3-1 pitch yeah. on the way. Swung off and belted off. It wasn't second deck, I don't think. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't believe it. I see the light. I believe you, but yeah, we watched a video on this before. We, we yes. were told to take a look at this, and I remember he got one thing wrong, and I thought it was a second deck. I he mean, didn't quite reach yeah. it, but that is unbelievable. Definitely, I mean, we're getting the percentage come through there, zero point zero two seven. Yeah, I love that it's broken down like that because at the time we just admired how crazy the prediction was, but to know how rare and unlikely he actually was. It is crazy to see. <laughs> At the time, he was in season number 33 calling Mariner games. He had seen it all, or so he thought. Babe Ruth in the 1932 World Series gets the most love for a called home run shot, despite being, you know, Babe Ruth. Blowers confidently called his shot for a 23-year-old fringe big leaguer batting eighth in the lineup who'd yet to ever hit even a single homer, while also including every detail imaginable. And he nailed it all. If there has ever been a more eerie sports prophecy, I have not seen it. You're going to take back your here here we go now. Dream. Here we go. I mean, <laughs> it didn't get a second deck. Another Mariner's luck turned in a different direction. You see, Adrian Beltre famously didn't wear a cup at third base. When he was a rookie, Ooh. the Dodgers tried to get him to wear one, even fining him every time he didn't. He refused, and they eventually gave up. All was well. <laughs> Until August 12th, 2009. <laughs> no. Yeah, I thought this might be coming. This is a weird, this is a weird season. The bad energy of the moment seemed to emanate throughout the stadium, spreading bad vibes and disrupting electronics. The home plate camera pulled all the way out, which it never, ever does on an infield play. The third base side camera didn't really catch it. We don't really get a good look at it. Maybe it's for the best. Incredibly, Beltre stayed in the game and even scored the winning run in the 14th inning. But it would be a few weeks before he played again. Even then, he refused to wear a cup throughout the rest of his career, reasoning, I already had three kids, I don't want any more. Wow. Fair enough. <laughs> September 1st. It's his first at bat since the injury. His walk up music plays. Mike Butcher, a, a word or so at the mound. And here comes Belpre, who's missed 18 games. You hear that? You recognize it? Hey. Prior to the game, one of Beltre's teammates had secretly arranged to have his walk up music changed to the Nutcracker Suite. <laughs> oh. Who would be so juvenile? Who on earth Each year would do George? such a thing?
No, it won't be, will it? Oh, of course they're playing. Some would point out that the Mariners' re-signing of Ken Griffey Jr. was little more than a crowd-pleasing oh. concession. Who cares? He was 39 now. About the same age they as they was when they signed him as a... Wait, what? Oh, I was so <laughs> lost. I was thinking, I was trying to think who he went to them, and I thought, no. They were playing the Angels there. Yeah. He went back to Cardinals, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. If not, that's what happened now. Um, <laughs> yeah, then it was all confusing me. I was yeah. like... Huh? I didn't know he had a second spell there. No, I didn't know he had a second spell 39 there. 39 years old. 39 years young. Young. When yeah. are you 39? December. This year? Mm. The publicity stunt decades ago. Junior certainly wasn't anything close to the player he used to be, but he still had a little power in his bat. More importantly, he immediately turned the clubhouse culture around. While 2008 was rife with finger pointing and temper tantrums, sense, I think an older, wiser right? junior sort of no, loosened everyone no, no. up and pulled the team together. In particular, he made Griffin a point Junior to bring Ichiro to the fold. What largely went unsaid during Ichiro's career is that it was often a lonely experience for him. Like Junior, who mostly wanted to spend time with his family and play Nintendo, Ichiro mostly just wanted to go home to his wife, dog, and comic books. And although he'd picked up some English over the years, the language barrier was still very real. Those around Ichiro said they'd never seen him so happy in the clubhouse. Ichiro and Junior were inseparable. And Ichiro would later that. say that his friendship with Junior was, quote, close to a miracle. Their lockers were right next to each other, and the two late 30-somethings were constantly seen shoving each other around and giggling. The only way they could have been more adorable is if they routinely got into tickle fights in the clubhouse. <laughs> Which they did. Constantly. <laughs> it was a perfect world. Ken Griffey Jr. probably knew by this point that he was never going to play in a World Series. He had never had any say in that, no matter what he did with his bat or his glove. But this he could change, and he did. He fixed this team. With the benefit of hindsight, we know that on-field contention wasn't in the cards for the Seattle Mariners, and has never been to this day. That was never happening. The only fight left was for happiness. For a year, at least, it was a fight they won. Griff. The Griffster's back. During his years the in Griffster. Cincinnati, he didn't go away <laughs> anyone wanted. In his eight and a half seasons there, the Reds were never a serious contender, leaving him once again to his individual pursuits. The big one, the one everyone wanted to see, was Griffey's challenge of the all-time home run record. Nobody expected him to keep up this breakneck pace throughout his career, but soon after he landed in Cincinnati, his numbers fell off a cliff. I was Reds. He the... just oh, kept getting course. hurt. I knew it was a team in red. I'm beginning with a C as well. Yes. Well, not technically, but similarly. Simply yeah. Common, yeah. I don't know. Thanks. Sorry. That's rough, isn't it? Yeah. That is it's one of the most frustrating things I've it's ever a bit seen. Of a Darren Anderson list, that. Over a six year span, he'd missed more than 400 games, about two and a half seasons worth. His bid to become the greatest home run hitter of all time was over. Junior was never reaching the mountaintop. Not as a member of a team. And not individually in the short term or the long term. By the time he finally returned to Safeco Field as a visiting player in 2007, the future we'd all imagined for him had disappeared. But Mariners fans didn't care about any of that. They went nuts for him. And when Junior's bat came back to life at the end of the 2009 season, everyone went nuts for him again. He hit three home runs in the final homestand and smacked a single in his last at bat. After the game, teammates threw Junior and Ichiro up on their shoulders and paraded them back to their dugout. Alex and I have spent months dwelling on the Mariners. What they mean, what they're for, how to appreciate them, the ultimate irrelevance of on-field success, the importance of celebrating a team for what it is and not for what it could be. And then I watched this. It's as though this team and these fans understood it all along. I was late to the party. You're looking right now at a team that isn't going to the playoffs. They didn't even really come close, but they're getting a standing ovation and waving their caps in gratitude. This is Whoville. I have never ever seen another team do this. This team and these fans aren't celebrating any kind of on-field accomplishment. They're celebrating one another. They're celebrating themselves. 
In this moment, the baseball gods offer Junior the perfect ending to his career. Something like a World Series title would have compromised the lesson here. His career should have ended at this moment, one in which he was the subject of unconditional love. You kept going. But Junior Ooh. didn't take the baseball gods up on this offer. He would return for one more year. Things can never be simple. Didn't look Things like will never year. end the way they're no. supposed to. No. Not for Ken Griffey wow. Jr. Not for the Seattle Mariners. Interesting. Yeah, obviously with hindsight, um, he probably would have gone out yeah. um, a season I, before he did. I but. wonder how much he was like into the home run records because they've been mentioned heavily throughout this series. And I just wonder how much... I know that fans were like would have been obsessing yeah. and looking at uh, uh, Savant and all of that and I try if that existed back then um, and trying to like, piece it all together. But yeah. I just wonder how much he actually was bothered about it. I don't know if he actually came out and said... Because some players are. Yeah. Some players really like personal that. achievements. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's but, a huge achievement as well, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm impressed by how many things I got wrong during that video. <laughs> um, oh, Billy Boone the boy? Yeah. From uh, from that famous Moneyball movie. <laughs> <Billy>. <laughs> I was clearly on about the Yankees coach. Yeah, I don't think his um, name is Billy, is it? <laughs> uh, nickname. Okay. His mates <laughs> call him Billy. Yeah, exactly. Okay. No, I call him Billy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, Ichiro, I got the name completely wrong. I, I, Ichiro. Ichiro, yeah. It, yeah, I, was, I, Ichiro. I got it completely wrong. Pronunciation is never going to be a strong point of mine. It just isn't. <laughs> got it wrong with the Cardinals. Cardinal fans looking back going, when do we have Griffith? Yeah, when, the, <laughs> when, when did he arrive? <laughs> just erasing him from Cincinnati history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it sounds like I didn't go too well there, no, so maybe no. I don't know. I don't know how many good moments he had there, but no, no really, really interesting episode. Yeah. Really interesting. Th that 2001 season, I mean, just wow. I mean, I said it during. I mean, just wow. Yeah, nuts. nuts. I mean, yeah. I, I really don't know what to add to it other than no. wow. And yeah, it's just it's so harsh. If a team has a season that good, you feel like they should almost just be put in the World Series. You know, sorry everyone else. Thanks for coming. Didn't know this was going to happen. But it did happen. You get an automatic buy straight so through. Straight, the yeah, that's yeah. it. Straight through. No one else <laughs> in the um, in the American League nah. could have taken part. No. Nope. So then it's just down to the National League and who goes to the World Series to uh, battle them. Padres. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah, really interesting. There's like another episode. It's going to be interesting to see what's in the next episode. Yeah. Yeah. Not the music video, because that obviously have Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. Um, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's um, it's the longest episode as well. So it is, yeah. I'm it not be a, a lot of wrapping up, but yeah, yeah it'll be interesting I, to see what, what we learn from that as well. I don't know if it is just going to be this big sign-off for mm. Ken Griffey Junior.'s last year in 2010, which looks like a grim season. Oh, horrible. So whether it's going to be that the Mariner fans just had a load of fun in 2010, despite that graph just. Yeah. plummeting in one direction but yeah no really music, refer <laughs> music references here just the all over the <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you just sometimes the time comes, you just know you need to wrap it up. Yeah, so. when people do that thing where they're like they dare someone to like put as many songs of a certain band in their interviews and stuff. That's what it seems like you're doing. I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely not, and I haven't got a good poker face. You okay. know. <laughs> So, so, so yeah, please drop the video a like. We hope you've enjoyed this episode with us. Um, yeah, we can't wait to see what's coming up in episode six. Yeah. Interested to know what's coming up in episode six. I really can't piece together what that's going to be no. about. So, yeah, it's going to be a pleasant surprise. Please let us know your comments uh, down below. We'd be really interested to hear from you, and we'll see you there.